The conventional image of a Buddhist monk is that of an ascetic, devoutly pacifist man. Yet contrary to that, the history of Buddhism is often defined by violence. Nowhere is this more evident than in feudal Japan, where the followers of Buddhism carved a bloody reputation as mercenaries, holy warriors, and revolutionaries. Welcome to our video on the Warrior Monks of the Rising Sun, where we will explain how a series of simple monasteries became some of Japan's greatest military powerhouses. Staying informed is crucial in our times, and the sponsor of this video Morning Brew is the simplest way to be aware of news and events. Before we subscribed to Morning Brew, our day started with an endless scrolling of social media, which is very inefficient and probably not good for one's mental health. Now that we've subscribed to Morning Brew, we get a free daily newsletter from Monday to Saturday. Morning Brew's digest is relevant, informative, and genuinely funny, and it gets you all the news you need to know in five minutes. Last week we learned of the disastrous situation around movie theatres, which might mean that the movie industry might work on distribution systems and deliver new content via streaming, while an article on Microsoft's acquisition of ZeniMax provided the most important figures and details. In short, there's no reason not to subscribe to Morning Brew if you're interested in business, finance or tech, as it's completely free and it takes less than 15 seconds to subscribe. Join us and click the link in the description below to subscribe to Morning Brew today. The warrior monks of Japan were known traditionally as Sohei, and were active in the nation from the 10th to the 16th centuries, centralizing themselves in monasteries, which were equal parts temples and fortresses. In function, the Sohei were not unlike the knightly orders operating in Europe and the Levant around the same period. But while the Templars and Hospitallers fought in service of lords and kings, their Japanese equivalents, for the most part, bowed to no man. The temples of the Sohei maintained a status as de facto independent enclaves, and as such, were the only pockets of feudal Japan free of the rule of the samurais and their daimyos. The Sohei were never a unified polity, but instead a series of independent temple orders, many of whom belonged to different denominations of Buddhism. However, there were some consistencies across the board. To begin with, Buddha was not a single man, but a title which means awakened one. They believed many souls in Asia had attained Nirvana in their lifetimes and achieved Buddhahood. Across Japan, most sects of Buddhism are offshoots of pure land Buddhism, which centers around the worship of Amitabha, a celestial Buddha also known as the Buddha Amida. Amidan Buddhism espouses that the mortal world is irrevocably corrupt, and that the only way to escape it is to die and be reborn into the celestial realm of the Buddha Amida. Since mortal life was inevitably depraved, the monks of Amida did not place much importance on meditation, celibacy, or earthly detachment, instead allowing themselves to enjoy the sins of mortality. As such, Japanese Buddhism diverged greatly from the ideas of non-violence the faith had been founded on. For example, Shinshu Buddhism, a subsect of the Amitabha Rite, promised that a celestial paradise awaited any who died in battle. Other denominations of Amidan Buddhism in Japan had similar tenets, making it possible for Buddhist monks across the isles to reconcile their faith with a life of warfare and violence. Generally speaking, Life in a Sohei monastery was more akin to a barracks than a spiritual cloister. We gain a window into the day-to-day -day lives of these warrior monks through the 16th century accounts of the Portuguese Jesuit Caspar Vilela, who observed the customs of the Buddhist temple of Nagoroji. Vilela claimed that the monks there rebuked the ascetic life so often associated with Buddhism, and openly enjoyed alcohol and the company of women. Vilela watched with awe as each monk crafted seven arrows a day, and practiced with the bow and the arquebus once a week. Their skill in metallurgy was remarkable, and according to the Jesuits' testimony, could slice through a man in armor as easily as a butcher carves a rump steak. Warrior monks were fearless and emotionally detached. Death was as natural to them as the sun and the stars, and even their brothers who perished in training accidents were regarded with little emotion. In battle, they were as skilled as any samurai, most famous for their deadliness with a naginata, 
while also being hawk-eyed with the Japanese longbow, and in later centuries, the arquebus. Now that we've covered a synopsis of what a Sohei is, it's time to tell the story of their rise to power and eventual downfall. The Buddhist faith originated in India, and over time its practices spread along the trade routes of the Silk Road. In 554, it reached the Isles of the Rising Sun via the Korean Kingdom of Bakje. Rather than conflicting with Japan's native animist faith of Shintoism, the new faith blended well with the old, and soon, Buddhism permeated into every level of Japanese society. In this early era, the emperors of the Yamato dynasty were still the absolute authorities in Japan, and despite claiming descent from the Shinto goddess of the sun, they were quick to incorporate the Buddhist faith into their society. During the Nara period in the 8th century, the imperial court patronized the construction of Buddhist shrines, particularly around the old capital of Nara, where the seven greatest monasteries were erected. A temple was, in theory, an independent entity, but the emperor had the final say in appointing its head abbot, or Zasu. Over time, these temples accumulated great political influence among the nobles, who endowed great wealth upon the monks who attended to their spiritual and personal needs. By the early Heian period, starting in 788, the most prominent of these monasteries was Enrakuji. It was founded by the monk Saicho, who established the Tendai sect of Buddhism, and according to legend, was the first to bring tea to Japan. Perched austerely atop the sacred Mount Hiei, it overlooked the new imperial city of Kyoto, an auspicious sign of the role it would play in many wars to come. The ancient Buddhist texts undoubtedly mandate a peaceful existence, but like with other religions, wealth and power made many a priest willing to warp the interpretations of scripture for political gain. Just like the early schisms of Christianity and Islam, the Buddhist temples of Japan soon started struggling to maintain their political primacy with the imperial court and to get favorable installments of head abbots by the emperor. At first, Belligerent monks would assert their will by parading non-violently down the streets of Kyoto while carrying mikoshi, sacred palanquins meant to intimidate superstitious officials into doing their bidding. These protests soon escalated into fistfights between opposing factions and, before long, armed conflict. In 970, the head abbot of Inrakuji ordered the creation of a standing army of monks to be permanently stationed in his temple to protect his coven's interests. Soon, other monasteries began doing the same, and an arms race ensued. It was here that the era of the warrior monks truly began. The late Heian period was in many ways defined by constant and bitter feuding between the island's great Buddhist monasteries. Among them, the most fearsome and ruthless were the priests on Mount Hiei, whose Sohei were the terror of both the imperial government and rival temples. Indeed, the imperial court tried many times to pacify the unruly battle monks of Inrakuji, usually by appointing a more cooperative priest from their rival monastery of Midera to be their abbot. Yet they'd find each attempt thwarted. Seven times the imperial court would try to impose a Midera monk as head abbot at Inrakuji, but each time an army of warrior monks would descend down Mount Hiei and convince the civil administrators to overrule the appointment. The imperial court was largely powerless to stop monks of different temples from settling their own matters between themselves with violence. It didn't take much to set off these conflicts either, as minor etiquette slights at communal shrine festivals were enough to provoke violent raids. While all the major temples committed major acts of organized violence, Enryakuji was usually the most fearsome, invading and burning down the temple of their bitter rivals in Midera on four separate occasions between 1081 and 1141. In 1113, those same monks had laid siege to and burned down the Kiyomizudera temple in Kyoto, which was essentially on the doorstep of the imperial palace. This was a testament to how powerful the warrior monks had become, and how readily they flaunted the emperor's authority. In a famous anecdote described in the Chronicle of Heike Monogatari, Emperor Go Shiwakawa In forlornly remarks, There are three things beyond my control 
the rapids on the Camo River, the dice at gambling, and the monks on the mountain. While the monks feuded among themselves, the imperial court in Kyoto declined, and the ambitious samurai had begun to establish themselves as the true power in the country. In 1180, war erupted between the samurai clans of Taira and Minamoto over who would puppeteer the emperor, and therefore control all of Japan. At this time, the monks in their monasteries were among the most well-trained and disciplined soldiers in the country, and as a result, both of the warring clans tried to court them onto their side with elaborate gifts of rice and silk. Enticed by personal gain, the head abbots of Midera and the Nara temples raised their naginatas and marched with the Minamoto. Meanwhile, Enryakuji's monks remained on their mountain, refusing to join their rival temples. This turned out to be the wisest option, for at the Battle of Uji, the Minamoto and their Sohei allies were soundly defeated. The Taira samurai spent the next three years burning a bloody path of vengeance against the temples who had borne arms against them, storming and incinerating Midera, as well as setting the entire city of Nara to the torch in 1183, and all seven of its great monasteries with it. While the Minamoto clan would eventually surmount their foes and establish the Kamakura shogunate ruling Japan, the damage that the Taira had done to the monasteries was catastrophic. Enryakuji was the only bastion of fighting priests that remained. The age of the warrior monk was not yet over, but the age of the samurai had begun. Between the 13th and 16th centuries, Japan was a nation increasingly dominated by the shogun, a military dictator ruling over a caste of daimyo lords and their hereditary Bushido-driven warriors. Nevertheless, the martial lay brothers of Buddha were not willing to fade into obscurity, and carved a place for themselves in this new order of hereditary warlords. Over time, the monasteries recovered from the devastation of the Genpei Wars, rebuilding temples and carving a healthy economic niche for themselves in the process. By 1280, Enryakuji monks controlled 80% of the moneylenders and sake brewers in Kyoto. Concerned only with profits, they were not above sending armed monks into the imperial city to persuade debtors to pay their dues. We should take this moment to appreciate the image of a Buddhist monk shaking down merchants like a seedy urban loan shark. As the great monasteries slowly rebuilt their standing armies and political influence, a great shift would once more rock the land of the rising sun to its core. In 1467, the conclusion of the Onin War saw the power of the ruling Ashikaga shogunate crippled. Japan shattered, ushering in a lawless age of warring samurai clans, the infamous Sengoku Jidai. For the most part, the various warrior monk orders remained cloistered in their fortress temples, while the petty daimyo lords cut each other to pieces in the fields outside. But while the well-armed and disciplined Sohei could assert their neutrality against the samurai, the same was not true for many less fortunate people. Life as a Japanese peasant in the Sengoku Jidai was not pleasant. Even in peacetime, any who did not show absolute obedience to the samurai could be legally cut down by a katana on the spot. In war, the haughty warrior caste showed even less regard for the lives of the farmers and fishermen who earned them their koku. The peasant's lot was a morbid one, and only needed a single spark to light a revolution. In the 1480s, a monk named Renyo had risen to prominence as the head priest of the temple of Honganji in Kyoto, spreading the worship of a sect of Buddhism known as Shinshu. Fearing his growing influence as a threat to their power, the monks of Enryakuji burned the temple to the ground. Renyo fled to Kaga province, finding common cause with the local peasants, who had long been suffering from the brutal realities of samurai rule. Under his leadership, the common folk took up arms and threw the samurai out of the province, establishing an independent Buddhist theocracy known as the Ikoiki, marking the first time in history that any part of Japan was not directly or indirectly ruled by either imperial courtiers or a samurai daimyo. The Ikoiki were not warrior monks per se, instead being made up of mainly peasant mobs, 
and even some disillusioned samurai. However, they were led primarily by Buddhist priests and had a deeply martial culture, a necessity in fending off the greedy daimyo. Their laws revolved principally on the precepts of Shinshu Buddhism, which they held supreme over the laws of emperors or shoguns. In function, the Ikoiki were holy warriors. Over the next century, the zealous peasants seized land in Nagashima and Ishiyama Hongenji and established firm strongholds in three fortress temples in the province of Mikawa. Fighting ferociously, with Buddha Amida's name upon their lips, it seemed very possible that they could fulfill their mandate to end the samurai tyranny. However, the more powerful the Ikoiki became, the more ire they drew from the surrounding lords, who were willing to stop at nothing to put down this existential threat to their social order. The consolidation of Mikawa put the Ikoiki on the very doorstep of the Matsudaira samurai clan, ruled by a young daimyo we know today as Tokugawa Ieyasu. This future unifier of Japan was untested in battle. It would be his clashes with the Buddhist peasant army that would temper him in a baptism of fire and blood. The Ikoiki fought him with unrelenting fury, but Ieyasu managed to defeat them at the Battle of Azukizaka in 1564, pushing them out of Mikawa and reducing their temples to ash. Meanwhile, another samurai firebrand known as Oda Nobunaga was carving a bloody path of conquest across Japan. As daimyo after daimyo fell to the great warlord, surviving enclaves of Ikoiki continued to ardently hold out against the great conqueror's armies. Meanwhile, back in Kyoto, a new but more traditional order of Sohei warrior monks had risen to prominence. They were known as the Locust Sect, and by the year 1500 had entrenched themselves in 21 fortress temples throughout the imperial city. Generally more amicable to the samurai, they had even defended Kyoto on their behalf against the Ikoiki when the peasant army had tried to take the city in 1528. One thing they had not accounted for, however, was the monks of Enryaku-ji. The mountain monks saw the Lotus warriors as insolent upstarts. In 1534, the monks from Hiei stormed down their hills and, like their ancestors before them, waged a campaign of brutality upon their sectarian rivals. All 21 Lotus temples were incinerated in the merciless ambush campaign, and a staggering 58,000 adherents of the sect were massacred. In launching an attack this brazen, Enryaku-ji had earned the attention of the samurai clans. Knowing they could no longer remain isolationist, the monks sought an alliance with the Azai and Asakura families. However, these two clans had the dubious distinction of becoming the enemies of the ruthless uniter himself, Oda Nobunaga. In 1571, the invincible warlord warned Enryaku-ji of the fate that would befall their temple if they persisted in their alliance with their doomed allies. But having defied emperors and shoguns for centuries, the monks rebuked Nobunaga's threats. Thus, Nobunaga set out to accomplish what so many had failed to do before him. With a massive army of 30,000, he attacked the sacred hillside of Mount Hiei. Although the monks fought fiercely, it was a doomed struggle against a massive, disciplined, and utterly ruthless samurai army. Before long, the ancient temple itself was engulfed in flames. While some monks fought to the bitter end, others calmly recited their ancient Buddhist mantras before committing themselves to the flames. With Enryaku-ji utterly annihilated, the last bastion of Japan truly free of samurai rule was the remnant of the Ikoiki. Soon, Nobunaga brought his armies to bear on their temple strongholds of Negashima and Ishiyama Hongenji, which he attacked simultaneously. The holy warriors put up a bitter, stubborn struggle. Twice Nobunaga's armies threw themselves upon the walls of Nagashima, but twice the ardent peasant monks drove them back with fusillades of deadly arquebus fire. Only on the third attempt did the Oda samurai finally breach the complex, massacring the tens of thousands of zealots inside. Ishiyama Hongenji, however, continued to hold out. While its walls were never breached, its head abbot surrendered in 1580 when the supplies in his temple had been depleted. 
he had fended off the great daimyo siege for 10 years. Oda Nobunaga died just two years later, betrayed by a trusted general. However, with the fall of the last great Ikoiki fortress, the fate of Japan had passed out of the hands of priests and was now firmly in the palms of the samurai. While scattered Buddhist sects would persist as minor entities for a few more decades to come, the age of the warrior monk was over. When Tokugawa Ieyasu finally unified Japan in 1600, society was draconically reordered and only samurai were allowed to bear arms upon punishment of death if anyone else attempted to do so. With that, the tradition of militant Buddhism that had endured for over 600 years was done. We are planning more videos on the history of Japan, so make sure you are subscribed to our channel and have pressed the bell button. We would like to express our gratitude to our Patreon supporters and channel members who make the creation of our videos possible. Now you can also support us by buying our merchandise via the link in the description. This is the Kings and Generals channel, and we will catch you on the next one.